The reading is taken from Acts 2, verses 14a and verses 36 to 41, and can be found on pages 1093 and 1094 in the Church Bibles. Peter addresses the crowd. When Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I have to say. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Reading from Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So I pray, may the spoken and the written word lead us to the living word, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You be seated. It's 
Today we have a story of loss and grief and failed hopes, a story of questioning and discussing, learning and growing, a story about recognition and encounter, and then great joy and excitement. It has drama, mystery, discovery, and a great reveal at the end. And what a great way to end Luke's gospel. He really is a master storyteller. There are so many great stories in his gospel. Many of the parables that Jesus told that we love, the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, they're told to us by Luke. And then the nativity stories, the angel's visit to Mary, the shepherds, and then the healing miracles, the healing of Jairus' daughter, all expertly brought alive for us by Luke. And here he ends it all with the events of that first Easter day. Now, other Gospels record events over several weeks, but Luke focuses just on one day. And at the center of it, he places this wonderful story of the two followers of Jesus traveling home to Emmaus. He uses this story to sum up his gospel. So, who are the characters involved? Well, one of them we know was called Cleopas. The other is unnamed. Now, in paintings, there are some famous paintings I'm sure you're familiar with. They're usually shown as two men. And yet in John's gospel, we learn that Mary, the wife of Clopas, was one of the women at the foot of the cross, keeping watch as Jesus died. Could it be her? Could Cleopas and Clopas be the same person? Could it be him and his wife Mary heading home after the traumatic events of Good Friday? Not two of the core disciples we're so familiar with, but a rare occasion when we get a glimpse into that bigger group who followed Jesus. So for today, I will assume it was Clopas and his wife. Now, these two had been there with the disciples that morning when the women arrived breathless from the tomb. With the news, the tomb was empty and they had spoken to an angel. And the angel had told them Jesus had risen. But the disciples don't know what to make of it. And these two seem to have decided to head home. They're discussing, puzzling over the events as they go. And their words to the stranger who joins them on the way shows their disappointment, their crushed hopes. We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But instead, he is dead. They call him a prophet, a man powerful in words and deeds. But it's all come to nothing or so they think. Now, I like Tom Wright's commentary on this passage, where he says that this journey to Emmaus echoes the journey we all take as we grow in faith. And I think that's quite a helpful way to look at it. Here, in the searching and questioning of Cleopas and his wife, we can see the way in which many people begin a journey of faith. They've heard a bit about Jesus, but they don't yet understand what he came to do. They may know he's a great teacher and a miracle worker, but they can't see what he could do for their lives. They long for a solution to their problems. In this case, it was the Roman occupation of Judea. But for us, maybe it's a longing for a happier life, a sense of purpose, for hope, for forgiveness, for new beginnings. But they're not sure how Jesus fits into all this. But then the two travelers are joined by a companion. They don't recognize who it is, which is odd, but Jesus obviously wanted it like that because it says they were kept from recognizing him. He walks alongside them and he carefully questions them. What are they talking about? What has happened? And as they answer, he listens. And when they finished, he explains to them what it all means. He does it by going back to the very familiar scriptures they will know, to the great story of God's salvation plan told through the Old Testament, showing them 
how what happened to Jesus was all part of that plan. Salvation has indeed come, but through his suffering and death. On this journey, Cleopas and Mary come to understand what Jesus has done, but there is more to come. Wouldn't it be great to know exactly what Jesus said, to be there journeying along with them, able to ask all those questions we have and have Jesus himself answer them? But for us too, it's often when we get that opportunity to try to explain what it is we think and believe and what we are struggling with, to ask the questions, to be open about our doubts, that we can move on and grow in our faith. If we don't do that, we may be forever stuck. And that's when we need someone to walk alongside us, to help explain things to us, to answer our questions, maybe to challenge us with new questions. And that might happen on an alpha course or in a house group, maybe a course online, maybe even listening to a sermon in church or even reading a good book. That way, we can grow in understanding and we can see with new eyes and come to a new and deeper faith. Maybe you can think of times when you've been enabled to do that. And maybe you can think of ways that you could continue to do that right now because learning about our faith is a lifelong process and we can always go deeper. Cleopas and his wife are having such a good time, they don't want it to stop when they reach home, and they invite the stranger to spend the night with them. Offer hospitality to strangers, says the book of Hebrews, for some have entertained angels unawares. Not many will have entertained Jesus. I wonder what would have happened if they thought they were too tired for guests. There was nothing much in the house to eat and they had just waved him goodbye. That might well have been where their Christian faith ended. But no, they invite him in, and they share a meal with him. And here the stranger does something very unexpected. He takes over the role of host. He takes the bread, he gives thanks over it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. Just as we will do in communion in a few moments. Had they seen Jesus do this a hundred times before, in shared meals, at the feeding of the 5,000, maybe even at the Last Supper? Whenever it was, it was so familiar that their eyes were opened and they recognized Jesus at last. They realized they are in the presence of the risen Lord. So they have gone from doubt and bewilderment through questioning and growing understanding to a real personal encounter with Jesus. They see and know Jesus for who he is. And for us too, as we grow in faith, we need more than just an intellectual assent to the arguments. We need to engage with more than just our minds. We need to use our hearts too. And we too can have an encounter with the risen Lord, have a living relationship with him. We can sit and eat with him at the table. I wonder when that has happened for you. Maybe it's been in worship, in church, or at communion. Maybe at that moment when you were baptized or confirmed. Maybe in a time of personal prayer or away on retreat. It could be in your own home or in a special holy place. It could be alone with others or in a, alone or with others. It could be indoors or it could be outside in the wonders of God's creation. But we can all experience God with us close and personal. We can all feel our heart burning within us as we encounter Jesus. 
Now, if you've not had that kind of experience yet, don't worry. Just set aside some time to be with Jesus and ask him to help you. Perhaps you might like to read this story for yourself and imagine that it's you traveling along the road with Jesus. Tell him the things you're struggling with. Ask him in to sit with you for a while and just enjoy being with him. As Jesus leaves them, Cleopas and Mary know they must return and share what's happened with the rest of the group back in Jerusalem. So they leave their dinner and they set off, hurrying the seven miles back along the road. I suspect they travelled rather faster than they had done on the way out. And when they get back, they find the others are excited too. Jesus has now appeared to Simon. And as they're sharing all that has happened to them that afternoon, Jesus himself appears in the room and they're able to see him and hear him for themselves. Great joys are meant to be shared. And Cleopas's and Mary's first response was to tell others to share their amazing experience. Can we identify with that? Wouldn't it be great if our experience of faith, of worship, of Jesus, was such that we couldn't wait to tell others about it? Maybe when you first came to faith, you were excited to tell others, and I hope everyone had someone to tell who shared your joy. But what about now? Our purpose here as individuals and as a church together is to share the joy, to tell others in our community Jesus is risen and he has indeed redeemed us all. It's a stunning way to end Luke's gospel. The road to Emmaus is a model of that journey of Christian discipleship. But of course it isn't the end because the story continues in Luke's part two, the Acts of the Apostles. And it continues for us too, as we take that joy out into the world, loving and serving our risen Lord. We bring our prayers to our Heavenly Father, giving thanks for our living Saviour, whose resurrection brings hope and salvation to all. Father, we pray for your church throughout the world, remembering that we are just a small part of the worship offered to you on this and every day. May Christians everywhere be aware of the power of Christ's resurrection in their daily lives, and may we all be messengers of joy and hope where we find sadness and despair. Today we are praying especially for the work of Christians Against Poverty. May all clients, staff, members, volunteers and supporters know the Lord's presence in all that they do. And we pray for our week of celebration starting today, that you will guide and inspire all involved so that more members of our community may come to know Jesus as their personal friend and guide. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Father, you created the world and sent your Son to bring salvation to all. We pray for the nations of the world, for wisdom and discernment for all called to govern or lead in whatever capacity, that we may live in a more compassionate and peaceful world. This week we bring to you in particular our own country thinking of the many difficulties we face at this time and praying in particular for the problems in the NHS. 
we ask you to hold all involved in your hands and to guide the solutions so that vulnerable people in need may always be treated with kindness, compassion, care, and dignity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, on this St. George's Day, we pray for the whole of the United Kingdom, giving thanks for the marvellous freedom and democracy that we enjoy. We pray for Charles, our King. May he know your guidance and peace as he approaches his coronation. And may this be a time of happiness, celebration, and thanksgiving for our nation. In our cycle of prayer, we pray today for the residents of Dornay Road, Pelham Way, Pelham Court, and Pelham Heights, each with their own particular joys, concerns, and needs. May they be good neighbours to one another. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Father, we pray for those in particular need at this time, remembering the sick, the lonely, the frightened, and those anxiously awaiting tests, results, or surgery. Holding to you especially Eldred Clark, Tim Carlier, Catherine Jobson, Valerie Good, Nigel Fenner, Tim Reader, Jenny Carlier, Beryl Wood, Jean Wiggins, Joan Hatcher, and any others known to us personally who are unwell. We ask you to touch them with healing love to give peace to the anxious, strength to the weak, and hope to us all. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Father, we remember before you all who have died, whether recently or in years that have passed, thinking today of Neil Carter and all whose memory we treasure giving thanks for their lives and the happiness shared with them. And we remember all who feel the pain of grief at the loss of a loved one, praying especially for those who will attend our church bereavement service next Sunday, for Carolyn Headley, who will lead the service, that all present may be deeply aware of your caring presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of Nicholas, George, and of all your saints, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 